So folks, it's, uh, gosh, it's nice to be here looking out and hopefully the folks online have managed to connect. Um, pathways to change. So on behalf of, uh, you know, our president, Cheryl Yates, and so nice that uh, you've been able to join us, Marianne, and uh, nice to meet you, Chris. Uh, Board of Governors, Deb, you're in the room somewhere. Thank you, Deb. Um, so, so nice to be able to welcome you to our sixth summit. So Tony, Ann, and Laura, Alice, can you believe we've been doing this six times? <laughs> um, now, when I give talks on global food security, which is quite often, I usually start with a shopping list of things that are going wrong. Agriculture is contributing about a third of the world's climate change emissions, which is a, a true fact. A third of the world's food is wasted at some point on its journey from farm to fork. Another true fact. Um, egg, we have enough food, but it's poorly distributed. As a result, we live in that world of stuffed and starved where both the number of hungry people and the number of people struggling with chronic illnesses linked to diet are both rising. That's another true depressing fact. Uh, another one that I, I particularly quote like, uh, if we all wanted to adopt the Canadian Healthy Eating Food Guide, we would have to quadruple the production of fruits and vegetables. In other words, if we all ate the Canadian Food Guide and sort of imagined it all being produced at the same time, we'd run out of fruits and vegetables in this country and globally by around March, and then we'd be eating starches and sugars and fats for the rest of the year. Uh, so really nice that Brent and Gil are here, because you're helping fill that gap a little bit. But that's a, that's a describing the problem kind of talk, and, and we're going to not try to describe the problem today. We're going to try to move beyond the problem and talk about the solution, the pathways to change. So uh, I'm going to set the sense of the possible up with a personal anecdote. Uh, and super big apologies to uh, friends who have heard me speak to this slide numerous times. Uh, I'm a good environmentalist in all things, and I recycle and reuse talk speaking material on a regular basis. So this is me sitting on my grandfather's lap, uh, brother Nick, cousin Dave and Ian in the background on the back of the tractor. Grandpa was an OAC graduate in horticulture from the 1930s. And if you fast forward from this photograph that I think was taken somewhere around 1975, and you found this scene in the 1980s or the 1990s, you might see me on the weekends or on the summer standing on the back of this tractor, my brother and cousins are, and I'd be having a, a, a pail of fertilizer pellets, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, on either side, and I would be sort of doing this, throwing that fertilizer off the back of the tractor, and Grandpa would be driving slowly through the sweet corn and the melons, the strawberries. That's how we did fertilizing. That's how we maintained soil health on our farm in the 80s, in the 90s. Uh, benefit of hindsight and a PhD in agriculture, half of that fertilizer was wasted. Didn't land at the right place at the right time for the plants to utilize. We were uphill from upstream from Lake Erie, so some of that nutrients would have ended up in Lake Erie, causing algae blooms. Uh, some of those nitrogen molecules that I threw in the 90s are probably, to this day, sitting in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas, slowly cooking our planet. But that was then, and, um, and this is now. Uh, this is a farm command center, for lack of a better word. A friend of mine named Christian Hebert, known to a bunch of us in this room, Eshim Biswas has had students on Christian's farm, Barb Chorchentruber from the Natural Step and Smart Prosperity Institute. We've been working with, uh, with Christian. Christian has about 35,000 acres under cultivation southeast of Regina. Christian has invested heavily in new technologies. He's using smart tractors and smart fertilizers. He's leaning into what we would call, or I might call, but he would not call, regenerative agricultural practices. More complicated crop rotation, disturbing the soil as little as possible. And he's also a data geek, which is why Ashim Biswas has had uh, students in, on his farm this past summer. And with the data, Christian can show four things pretty convincingly. Thing one is he's producing more food than he ever has before. His yields are higher. Thing two, he's using less inputs to produce those yields. He's spraying less, uh, less pesticides, he's putting less fertilizer down, he's driving his tractor less, he's using less diesel. So not only are his input costs lower, his environmental footprint is shrinking. Thing three, on most parts of his farm, the data that Asim's been collecting suggests that his soil organic matter is growing. 
And basically, soil organic matter is greenhouse gas emissions pulled out of the atmosphere and stuck in the soil. Now, there's lots we don't know about soil organic matter, how long it lasts, where it sits, tons of good science questions. But pulling out carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it in the soil helps mitigate climate change. And then thing four, the soil that's high in organic matter is really important because it acts like a sponge. It traps moisture from when it's needed, uh, when it's abundant and stores it for when it's needed. So he's able to do four things with us. He's able to boost yields, shrink his environmental footprint, uh, mitigate climate change and be more climate resilient. And that's because he's leaned into innovations. So it's been great to work with, um, with farmers like Christian and, and others and a team from the Boston Consulting Group and the Royal Bank uh, to put a series of reports out over the last year where we've tried to drill into a blueprint for how a Canadian agriculture can use innovations in a way to create those sort of wins that I just described. Now, I'm sure some of you are immediately thinking, that's a pretty big scale example. That's equipment costs a lot of money. You have to be farming a pretty big parcel of land to make those sort of investments. Does this have any relevance to, say, the hundreds of millions of small-scale farmers that dot the world? And I think the answer to that question is yes, if we get some things right. And uh, the first thing we have to remember is that these technologies, these innovations, they're not just technical innovations, they're social and policy innovations. They could scale. So what we've got in this slide is called a tractor swarm. It's a, small net, it's a network of small, independent autonomous vehicles controlled by an iPad or a mobile device. And these are actually work quite well to cultivate small parcels of land. And using this sort of technology, we're starting to see innovators, startups, entrepreneurs start this company. This is a company based in India, designed on an Uber-like model to take tractor swarms and allow small-scale farmers to rent their services for a couple hours. This is particularly important for women where uh, it frees people up from the drudgery of hand labor on a farm. And so we're not there yet. I'm not trying to paint a utopic picture of the future and be technologically naive and optimistic, but there is potential here. In other words, I believe that innovations properly applied can lead us to a pathway for change. And again, innovations in a broad sense, technological capital intensive innovations, policy innovations, social innovations. And we have to keep a question firmly in our minds. How do we ensure that innovations can help get the outcomes we desire? We have to ask the question of how, not if or whether, it's how. And in my opinion, there's five things that we need to keep in mind if we want to have an answer to this question be a strong yes, innovations leading to change. And the first thing is we need to forward and center all of our work, I believe, in a dialogue process, by which I mean too often, in the past, indeed in the present, uh, people of privilege, people who often look and sound quite a lot like me, assume we know the answers to people's problems and we put forward solutions without being aware of systemic inequalities, systemic racial inequalities, systemic gender inequalities, uh, systemic economic inequalities. And so by putting everything or centering everything on a dialogue process and empowering right-seeking and equity-deserving groups to participate in the dialogue process, not only is it, quote, the right thing to do from a, a his, writing historic wrongs perspective or a social justice perspective, it actually results in better decision-making processes. It's harder, it's more complicated, but it results in better decision-making processes. So it's been great over the last year to work with a number of people in the room, notably Lenore Newman and Peter Dillon, both of whom you'll hear from later, to establish a dialogue process, which I'll describe right now, where we've asked a question, how can digital innovations result in economic gains for producers in Canada? and environmental gains in terms of climate mitigation. And our dialogue process looks a little bit like this. We start with three chairs, Peter Dillon, Lenore Newman, and myself, diverse backgrounds. Uh, and then we move and we established a advisory panel led by Rennie Van Ecker and Bettina Hanlon. Included in the advisory panel are producers and other people who participate across the food chain. Aaron Doherty and, and Janice LaBeouf then hired a group of great grad, uh, great grad students doing interviews, focus groups, online surveys. And out of, the la out of the last six months, we've been able to cull 100 perspectives from across the food system. If you're interested, we now have a What We Heard report. It will be 
Uh, it's available at the front desk, and Lenore will be leading a session where we're looking now for feedback on the What We Heard report so that we can then spend the next six months testing these ideas before coming up with final recommendations. And the reason I'm giving you a little bit of detail on this is that I think by centering a dialogue process, or centering solutions on a dialogue process, you end up with locally relevant solutions. You end up with, uh, with solutions that make sense to the people who are trying to overcome the problem. So that's point one. Point two is that a dialogue process on its own won't solve all the problems, and of course we need cutting edge research. We need to be pushing back the boundaries of human knowledge and coming up with new solutions to old problems. So in this photograph, good friend and colleague Maria Corradini, Errol Chair in Food Quality, Malika Singh, one of our early grad students. One of the things that Maria is doing in her lab as an illustration of the need for cutting edge research is she's taking food ingredients and extruding them through a 3D printer. Figuring out how the structure of food may be resulting in better food safety. Can you make food last longer and stay safe longer simply by changing its structure without relying on potentially harmful chemical inputs or preservatives or polluting plastics? Can you simply change the structure of food and solve the problem of food safety and food waste? It's not a complete solution, but it's a new way of attacking an old problem. Point three is that we need to do a better job of figuring out the behavioral cues and how people respond to incentives. For instance, if we want more farmers to be like the one I mentioned a few minutes ago, Christian Hebert, and go down that path towards investing in technologies and adopting more regenerative management practices, we need to know what will actually motivate people to make that change. And so we have uh, Tungzi Lee, who, sorry Tungzi, your head's been cut off on this version of the slide. Look on the sl version of the slide over there for Tungzi's picture. Um, Tungzi Lee, Errol Family Chair in Behavioral Economics, surveying with her students 850 farmers at the local uh, outdoor farm show a couple of weeks ago in, in Woodstock, Ontario, asking the question, what would it take to get you to shift? So that's something about dialogue, something about research, something about figuring out behaviors, incentives, that's three. And we need to do something about policy making. We need policy to do two things, in my opinion. One, create the right incentives. That's the first thing. And second thing, we need policy to get out of the way of innovators and stop tying people as much in red tape. This is an area where a lot of us in this room have spent a tremendous amount of time. We have uh, two, uh, a current deputy minister and a former deputy minister of OMAFRA in the room. So thank you, John and Deb, again for coming, coming out. We've spent so much time. Tom Rosser, uh, assistant deputy minister in Ag Canada, who's been instrumental in so many files that we've worked on together. So thank you also to you, Tom, for, for coming along. And really what we need to do is we need to be working better together across the silos. Uh, an area that Errol Food Institute has spent a lot of energy on in terms of policy is the topic of school nutrition. Uh, as most people, I hope, in this room know, Canada is the only rich, so-called developed, so-called country to not have a national school nutrition program. This is an area that, that a large number of us at the uh, Ag Canada and the uh, Food Policy Advisory Council uh, have been working on. And I need to say a huge thank you to, to Laura Errol and the Errol Family Foundation, not only for supporting events like today and the work of the Errol Family Foundation, but Laura, in particular, the leadership position you're taking and the Family Foundation is taking on the issue of school nutrition and the announcement a couple of weeks ago at the provincial level of new funds moving into the school nutrition program. So this is an area of, of vital importance and... Um, uh, Jess Haynes and Amberly Rotz, amongst others, have put a bunch of material on our website on this important topic. So, something about dialogue, something about research, something about incentive, something about policy, and something about training. If we want to find a pathway to change, to develop a better sustainable food system, we need to be investing more in the next generation. And goodness, it's a challenging moment for the next generation. I mean, from just a food system leadership perspective, the next generation has to be disciplinarily excellent. We need great sociologists and economists and food scientists and engineers. So Evan and, and Twala, it's, it's great that you were able to introduce us. On this slide, we see a, a, a trip led by Gina Rex to a local grain facility. This was just a couple of weeks ago as part of some of the educational work that we do. Because not only do we need students that are disciplinary excellent, they've also got to be entrepreneurial minded. They also have to be systems thinkers. They also have to have uh, an ability to work in teams and pivot. It is a bewildering training environment that we're sending young people into. But the next generation is, of course, 
the people that are going to wear the mistakes that we make today. So we have to be doing it. So those are the five things that I think need to happen if we want to embark on a pathway to change to seize the innovations and make sure the innovations are applied in the way that we need them. We need something about dialogue we need, and centering local solutions. We need research to give us new ways of solving old problems. We need to create incentives to monitor and manage behavior. We need to be working on policy to align these things. And we need the next generation to be disciplinarily excellent, but also broad-minded systems thinkers. That's a lot. But if we do those things, we can have, I think, healthy and sustainable food for all. And in this moment of, of incredible geopolitical uncertainty, where, where we're suddenly aware that our food systems that nourish us three times a day, five times for me, uh, are, not, uh, are not as stable as they once perhaps were, we need to be thinking very critically, not about the problem so much as the solution. So where I'd like to wrap up is with a nod to the past. Uh, and I'd like to, I think my Uncle Dave is on the call right now. So hi, Uncle Dave. My Uncle Dave got me the photograph on the left here. That is my, I'm going to try to get this right, great, 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 great grandfather, Thomas Appleyard. I think I've got that right. The woman on the right is Adelaide Hoodless. Uh, they both led interesting lives in Ontario in the 1800s. Uh, I'll start with my grandfather's grandfather. I think I've got that right. Uh, he ran a sawmill, was a farmer and ran a sawmill not far from Guelph, Ontario. Uh, unfortunately, Thomas came to a tragic end. Uh, industrial accident. He was thrown into a spinning saw blade, lost both his legs and died a few seconds later on the floor of the sawmill. Tragic end. Adelaide Hoodless grew up in Hamilton, Ontario. Lost a child to bovine tuberculosis at a young age, probably from drinking tainted milk. Thomas' story ends on the sawmill floor. Adelaide's story continues. Adelaide goes on to devote her life to food safety. She goes on to found the McDonald Institute, which is one of the three founding colleges of the University of Guelph, that I think, Anne, you are essentially a graduate of that many years later, if I'm not, not mistaken. Uh, my point in putting Thomas and Adelaide up here is to remind us that past innovators found and confronted what felt, must have felt like insurmountable problems. Much like we today feel like we're confronting insurmountable problems. Past innovators did. And I, I don't want to take anything for granted. I want to very sincerely acknowledge the tremendous work that still needs to be done. But in many ways, having your grandfather thrown into a saw blade and dying on a floor is, is kind of removed from, from what Canada experiences. I mean, there's terrible work conditions all over the world, and I'm not undermining that. But I think we can, at some level, say progress on that front has been made. And I don't worry about my children catching bovine tuberculosis from tainted milk in Canada anymore because we have good food safety regulations. And again, we take nothing for granted. We acknowledge that progress once gained can be lost again. And we acknowledge the unevenness of privilege around the world. We can say, I think, that you know, the lesson for me of Thomas Appiard and Adelaide Hoodless is that progress is possible. Pathways are possible. So it's that sort of spirit of, of learning for the past, to find the future, develop those pathways that I would like us all to hold as we hang out together for the next, next few hours. And with that, I'd like to do two things, finally. First of all, a huge sincere thank you on behalf of uh, the Errol Food Institute team and Alice and Muriel and uh, uh, every, everybody. Uh, it's, it's wonderful that you are spending your time with us today and we don't take that for granted at all.